Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining uh, today's uh, session. Uh, my name is Jerry Gallagher. I'm part of Deutsche Bank's European Consumer Goods Team uh, out of London. Uh, it's my very great pleasure to introduce to you Stefan Bomhardt, the CEO of Imperial Brands. And with Stefan today is Peter Derman, the head of IR. Stefan, Peter, welcome to our 18th annual Global Consumer Conference. Thank you. So, so today's, today's uh, presentation from Imperial will take the form of a fireside chat. I'm going to ask uh, some questions, but please feel free to use the video link that you have within the, the web link system to ask any questions you may have, and I will take those on board and ask them to the Imperial team as well. But ahead of me kicking off with some questions, I'm going to open, let Stefan open up with some introductory comments about the business. Stefan, over to you. I mean, Jerry, first, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for all of you for attending, because I think for us, um, this Deutsche Bank conference, I think, is a great opportunity because we only revealed our new strategy for the company in January of this year, and I joined Imperial as a CEO last year in July. And I think the, the strategy that we outlined clearly defines how we want to transform as a team Imperial in the next five years. And some of you will be aware, we announced our half-year results uh, at three weeks ago, and we are seeing the first signs of the embedding of that strategy in these results. Uh, at the half-year point, um, top-line performance was up, bottom-line performance was up, and free cash flow generation was up. So all three actually up in the right direction for the first time in quite a while, which I think I see as a positive sign. But I think more importantly, Prey, as we talk about the strategy in a second, is when you look at our core tobacco business, a business that in the last couple of years in our top five market has seen consistent market share declines. For the first time with the half year results, we reported that we were addressing the decline and we're actually for the first time in a while have actually grown share a little. I wouldn't read too much into it, but it is the fact that these significant share declines have arrested us is a, is a good sign of the new strategy. The other important piece is as part of the strategy, and that is a very important piece, I'm sure we speak about it more, uh, is also a refocused attention and dedication to our NGP business, our reduced harm proposition for our consumers. And while it's early stages, uh, what we are clearly committed to is about a focused investment strategy behind NGP with some clear selected choices. And we are preparing the tests that we announced in the January um, Capital Markets Day. They're all well on the way, getting ready in the next couple of months to give us the learnings that we're looking for. Yeah. So overall, in summary, very happy to be here. I think it's a great opportunity to talk about the strategy because the first signals, the first green shoots are there, but there's for sure lots of opportunity today to explain certain parts more. Yeah. So over to you, Jerry, again, because I think you have yourself some questions. I do. Thank you, Stefan. So uh, it was interesting you mentioned in your opening comments the, the attention to the reduced risk products, next generation uh, category part of the business. And, but within that, I think it's fair to say the balance of the focus of the business in terms of combustibles against NGPs since you've become CEO has maybe tilted a little bit more towards combustibles than it perhaps was under prior management at Imperial. Could you uh, talk about that and take us through the logic and the thought process about adopting that slight tweak in the strategy and refocusing perhaps a little bit more emphasis on the combustible business? Yeah, very happy to do. I mean, Jerry, for me, one of the key principles is about you know, is start off with the consumer and who, which consumer are we and the industry serving here? We are serving adult adult smokers. Yeah, and reality is in our business, ninety eight percent of our business comes from our consumer smoking cigarettes or fine cut tobacco. Yeah, two percent of our business comes today from NGP products. And the reality is about when you apply this lens, as excited as I am, like prior management, about the opportunities that resides on the NGP side, my job is also making sure looking about all the needs of consumers. And it became very clear 
that in the past and the desire to build an NGP business, yeah, we took our eyes off the ball on looking after our core business. Consistent share declines five years in a row in our top five markets, I'm a marketer by training, yeah, is for me a sign that we weren't doing our job good enough. What is today the bulk of our business? And also the bulk how consumers want to interact with Imperial. Yeah, so it's fair to say with the new strategy, there is a refocus on the core business, which by the way, also from a shareholder perspective is where Imperial generates the cash yeah, for, for satisfying the needs of a chores and the cash also to invest in NGP products. But at the same time, I think it's very important. You shouldn't read into this at all, a different level of commitment to NGP. Yeah, because it's very fair to say that our NGP strategy of the past hasn't been successful. Massive investments have not resulted in building a sustainable business. And I think behind a new strategy, I think we've done a lot of homework to understand about what has worked and what ha not, has not worked. So I think the strategies that we outlined behind NGP is has a much higher chance of success because it builds upon the strengths of Imperial, like our route to market. It focuses on the markets where we actually have deep consumer knowledge, not some other exciting markets where Imperial has very little presence. So I would argue the strategy is the right strategy because it looks after our consumers. It looks after them in what they today, every day can want to interact with Imperial on our core brands and tobacco, but it also focuses on building a dedicated NGP business grounded in what are strengths of the business. Yeah. So hopefully Gary, that gives you some more color. What is the balance between these two? It does, thank you very much and perhaps moving uh, leveraging off that to what extent do you have to be market leader in your markets whether it's in the combustible space or the ngb category of a particular market for your strategy to, to be successful yeah, i think it's a very interesting question because i think uh, often especially on the ngp side is the image being created you have to be market leader in order to make money and be successful but I think that was one of the interesting works we did, because partly to be fair, our strategy on NGP, especially in vaping, was if we wanted to become a market leader. But if you have to step back, Imperial has been consistently the number three and number four. I mean, in most markets, we're the number three or the number four and sometimes number two. Reality is, when you look at our P&L, that in the combustible business is a very comfortable position to actually make some very good money and be a meaningful player in the marketplace. So I think one important change of our strategy on the NGP side is when the NGP segment develops, all our data says that actually if it's a sizable market in an individual market, there is clearly room for a number two and the number three. And your consumers want a choice. And your trade partners, even more importantly, in some cases, no trade partner out there has an interest of having a monopoly there because it, it actually devalues the, the power of the trade. So the reality, what's changed behind our strategy, we're replicating the ambition that we have in our core business also for NGP, which also means from an investment perspective, we're not the market leader. Our ambition is not to become the market leader in NGP. So we will focus on markets where somebody else like in a core tobacco business, has developed the market. And we come in to offer consumers a choice, which also from an investment perspective is a much more modest level of investment. So I think it serves us better. It's much more consistent in the DNA of, of us as a company. It builds on the success track record that you've built as a company for 50 years in our core business. Okay, thank you. Um... Um, then within the combustible business, historically, um, Imperial used to talk about its, its local brands a lot. Um, it then sort of drifted away from those local brands, of my perception at least. Mm -hmm. And you've come, you've come into the business and you've refocused the business back on those local brands. And could you take us through the thought process around that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a very astute observation that there is a change on our brand focus behind a new strategy. I think what is important, um, and why is that? Because we come back, we, we said we want to be consumer centric. Yeah, and if you are consumer centric and you look at the brand portfolio, and as I've done with the team, go through all the consumer data, the brand equities in the market, given our history, Imperial 
because as you will know well, Jerry, is about Imperial bought a number of local champions over the years. With them came some very strong local brands. Now, we also have some global brands, but it's very clear in our portfolio, especially when we look through the lens of our top markets, there's some very important local brands that in our pursuit of a purely global strategy that we neglected. Yeah? And the reality is the consumers in the markets don't know whether this is for Imperial, a global brand, a local brand. It's their brand. And what they would have observed in the last couple of years that brands like um, Fortuna and Noble, which is brand number one and number two in Spain, which is one of our top five markets, we've invested very little money in them. We've invested in, in West as a global brand. But the reality is the West brand, after many years of investment, is still a smaller brand than these two. So what we are now doing behind our new strategy, put consumer first, decide what are the right brands in a local market, and then decide whether the investment goes against the global brand, where this is right, it will continue to be invested, but we are now supplementing that with some selected investments behind our local jewels. And I think that is the right strategy for Imperial, because that is a true reflection of the brand portfolios that Imperial has actually pulled together in the last couple of, years, of decades. Okay. And the, um, the proof, to be clear, Jerry, you see it in the market share development in Spain, as I referred to earlier, uh, we, we stopped the market share decline and Spain is a good contributor. In Spain, we've lost market share for quite a number of years. We gained market share in the first half year and the exclusive driver of that was these two local brands where we started to reinvest. Now, it's very early days, but it gives me the confidence that the strategy that we're implementing on, on being more clever and more consumer centric about making our choices, which brands we invest to can make a difference also to our financial performance. Okay, I think I had a question around consumer centricity. It was based yeah. upon uh, the fact that the prior management used to talk about Imperial being consumer centric, but you've taken the view that perhaps that wasn't the case. It feels like um, the use of local brands is maybe the answer to why you believe that is the case. But could you expand on that a little bit, just to give just give an insight as to what you're bringing to the table to advance that consumer centricity? I mean, I'll be always very open with you. I mean, I think one of the things. Look, I'm a consumer goods person by training. I mean, I started as a brand assistant at Procter and Gamble a long time ago, so I spend all my time in 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 marketing and sales and general management. Uh, funny enough, and it's the fact, I'm the first CEO from Peru who has a consumer goods background. My predecessor came from a finance background. Her predecessor came from a manufacturing background. So I think there is a, a different sense, I would argue now, and it's the way how I ask questions. As you say, we might have talked a lot about consumer centricity, but the fact is the company didn't have on the executive committee somebody looking after consumers in the last four years. Yeah, that's the fact. We deprioritized it as an investment opportunity. And the reality is that's a signal you sent back into the business. Yeah, and that might have been okay when your market shares would be in a good place and you weren't trying to build new brands in the NGP space. But I truly believe behind a new strategy where now actually it's the right thing to do. And it's one of these self-help opportunities we have. None of our competitors would have not had a head of consumer on the executive committee in the last couple of years. Yeah, so I think that is clearly an opportunity that we have as a business. And that's why I'm excited about the opportunity we have in front of us at Imperial. You're doing a good job of answering my next question as part of your answer to my <laughs> previous question. But, but, I'll, okay. <laughs> but I'll crack on. And what I mean by that, you, you t you've changed a lot of the senior management at Imperial yeah. since you joined. Not, not all of it, but a significant yeah. amount. Could you expand on why that's the case? Absolutely. Well, it, it builds, in, in principle, when I came in in July, Gary, an early observation was, if you, if you look from a consumer goods background, also within our industry, it was, for me, noticeable that there were several gaps on the executive committee. Yeah, the, the marketing gap we just talked about, so there is now a chief consumer officer. But what I've also found interesting is about um, in an organization, we did not have a head of talent or people, or HR, whatever you want to call it, on the executive committee, which is unusual. Yeah. We also didn't have a head of strategy. Yeah. 
on the executive team, which is unusual for a company in an industry that is going through that level of transformation. Yeah. So I would have observed there were clearly three positions missing and we've been able to recruit a top talent uh, for a chief consumer officer with a background in Pepsi and Fonterra. Uh, we've been able to recruit with, with Alison uh, Clark, a top talent as a lead, as a people leader. And with Murray McGowan, somebody who has a very strong strategic background in McKinsey, but also in operational backgrounds in, in companies like Whitbread. Yeah. So I do believe have really strengthened. We've put the position that are critical for success in our industry at the top table. And we've been able to attract, I believe, top talent from outside the industry. Now that was supplemented. There were two retirements in the company. The CFO, uh, Oliver Tunt, uh, came to the six years and the same applied to head of supply chain. Yeah. And there we have recruited a new CFO who started now in early May with a background 20 plus years in Nestle, uh, but also, and last couple of years at Fonterra as the CFO, but also very strong operational background. Something we didn't have in Peru in the CFO job, to be fair. Somebody who, who with Lucas Paravicini, who joined us here, he spent his run businesses for Nestle himself. He isn't just a finance person. So I do believe we now have the right level of finance leadership on board to execute against the strategy. And on the supply chain side, we had a fantastic person in the in the team, but after 30 years with the company, he unfortunately had to retire. And we've been able to attract a top talent uh, with, with Javi Huerta, who joined us from Unilever. He ran Unilever's supply chain for food and beverages, which is half of Unilever, and brings some very strong ESG credentials with him as well. So I do believe when I look at the management team that will drive Imperial forward. We have significantly upgraded the quality of the team, but also supplemented some, mis uh, some key functions that are critical for the success of the company for the years to come. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah. Could I just go back to the balance between combustibles and uh, next generation uh, product, revenues, profits? Yeah. So while, while the business looks set to um, deliver against its short, medium term aspirations. I just want to dig into the makeup of those aspirations because while in total you may deliver, there is a debate as to which what multiple the market will put to combustible revenues and profits and what multiple the market will put to uh, next generation revenue and profits. So whilst the business in totality may deliver, if the mix of the delivery is not sufficiently balanced or enough NGPs, the multiple won't move and the value creation won't be as much as it otherwise would be. Could you talk about that and how the board thinks about that sort of thing? Sure. I mean, Jerry, I think the number one, absolutely, I, I, it's very clear. If you are in our industry, yeah, you should have a consumer offer on both sides. Let's be clear. So that's also, it's one of building a meaningful NGP business for Imperial was one of the attractions for me to join. I'm the only non-industry CEO in this space. I'm also a non-smoker, yeah? But I can clearly see the opportunities that is there, but it has to be both. So I'm fully with you. For me, the important point, and I come back to this consumer centricity, yeah? It, what is important, we need to have an offer for our consumers on both sides, yeah? And I do believe it's important that we build a successful NGP business. I, I want to be very clear because the value creation only comes if it's a profitable and sustainable NGP business. And I think that is one of the key focus areas. So the arrival of a chief consumer officer, the, the reunification of our whole NGP team under him yeah, to work together gives us a much higher chance going forward to actually build a meaningful and profitable NGP business. So I think it's, it has to be both, but I also want to be very humble about it. Reality is the consumers will decide how big the industry will be able to have their turnover in these new products. Our job together is to give them as much exciting product offers and consumer propositions that they can make that switch. But the reality is that switch <clears throat> That's sometimes helpful when you just look at the data and you haven't lifted the journey. You just need to look at the data. That switch over from the core tobacco business to NGP has been very distinctively slower than anybody anticipated. And when you sit down with consumers and 
trust me, last 11 months, I sat down with a lot of consumers and focus groups, much easier with Zoom now across the world. And it is, the switch over is a hard journey for consumers because smoking is one of the most heavily ingrained habits that you have. So switching to a very different behavior takes time and it's a hard effort for consumers. That's why this segment hasn't developed as fast as some people thought before. Maybe if I could right. just add a... So if I could just yeah. add, I, th I think the other the other point is about, about, about what we're doing on tobacco, is that we also see opportunity to, to grow you know, value from the tobacco side, partly because of the fact we've you know we've undermanaged that part of the business. We've been, as Stefan said earlier, we've been losing share in the five more most profitable markets. So if we can stabilise that, plus in addition, I think one of the opportunities we have probably relative to peers is a self help opportunity in tobacco. Which um, you know, I'm not sure. Fully, we, we clearly need to demonstrate that. I'm not sure it's fully appreciated in, in the business. But there's an area where we can step up a little bit better, particularly in terms of how we've managed some of our back office costs, etc. Where there's an opportunity to take some costs out, reinvest that, and drive a better performance out of tobacco. So it is a it's a balanced strategy which which looks at you know drives seeks to drive value out of both sides. But but it's also important to realise there's there's a kind of catch up opportunity in tobacco which we've we've yet to realize as well, which is, is embedded in the five-year plan. Thank that, that's, that, that's, that's helpful. Um, I was going to move on to ESG, but, but you guys have said a couple of things around the consumer, which, which yep. uh, are interesting. Yep. Now, partly, I think, down to the revised strategy you guys have adopted mm -hmm. with, with, a, with a, maybe a greater focus on, on um, uh, heat not burn rather than vaping that the business previously yeah. had. I get a sense that the industry is pivoting to favour heat not burn as the winner and in inverted commas in new categories as opposed to vaping. Let's put let's put all all aside. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Could you could you help us understand how you see that, uh, Jerry? I wouldn't agree. Yeah, um, and let me explain why. Um, what's right to see. When you look at this, um, what does the consumer offers? Yeah, about meeting that reduced harm need for consumers or this desire. Uh, where I, where is right, when you look at lately, heated tobacco has made, has grown faster than vaping. But I come back to this point about, let's start with the consumer. Yeah, it depends what market you're looking at. Yeah. And in Japan, for example, yes, it's heated tobacco, which, which many people don't know because nicotine vaping is forbidden in Japan. So no surprise, it never had a chance to actually compete and for the consumer really to decide. Yeah. The same in the US, you have a very large vaping market because heated tobacco wasn't an offer. And when it kind of became an offer, it, it had a very low offtake. Yeah. So I think the message I would have, um, the consumers haven't decided really what they want. None of the propositions today actually are yet really breakthrough because if they would be, you would see a significantly faster uptake of these offers. Yeah. So I think when you come back to our strategy, that's why I'm actually quite excited about our NGP strategy. What's different in the past? If you put it bluntly, we were focusing all on vaping, nothing else. That was the breakthrough technology that was supposed to be the winner. Yeah. And that was all acts into one basket. Now, reality is, that the consumers across the world, when you look at the data, they are still deciding individually in what market, whether they want heated tobacco, they want vaping, or they want oral nicotine. Yeah. So for a global player like ourselves, it's important that we have an offer for consumers and use the lens of the market that are important to us. Yeah. So don't think there is a clear winner, nor do I believe there will be a clear winner in the next couple of years. That doesn't mean one category won't grow faster than the other. And the one subject we haven't talked about is the level of government support or lack of support for NGP overall or specific propositions. Yeah, because you can clearly see in certain markets, the growth of heated tobacco has been driven by governments clearly embracing that technology. Or you see vaping, because as we both hail from the UK, Public Health England has clearly favoured vaping. And surprise, surprise, you have a massively bigger vaping market than a heated tobacco market. Yeah. So my sense is it isn't decided yet. Consumers haven't picked their clear preference. So I think you do have to listen constantly what consumers want and you must have an offer based on the individual market preferences. Okay, but before I move on, could you just talk about 
how non-nicotine adjacent categories fit into that. Will they ever be of any consequence size give, uh, compared to the rest of your business? What's your feeling around that? It's, it's, a tough, it's a tough question for me because I've focused so much on our core business so far. So, Jerry, I, I reserve the right to come back to you in a year's time on this one. Oh, yeah, no the, the big the reality is I think there's so much growth opportunity in our core business, what people rightly reminded us of about we, we have so much self-help in our core tobacco business. Yeah, that, that is a significant top and bottom line growth opportunity for Imperial. I think we have a very significant opportunity to participate much more and more successfully in the NGP opportunity. Do I believe there is an opportunity beyond? Yes, I do. Yeah, because many of the skill sets beyond nicotine that we've built as a company, the local market knowledge, the knowledge of regulation, the knowledge about how to market to consumers is going to be relevant in that sector as well. But I would argue today that so much opportunity in our core, it would be it would be a distraction to put our focus on this at this point in time. But it's clearly one of the growth opportunities available to us down the road. Okay, I'll um, th I'll move I'll I'll move on now to talk a little bit about uh, or I'll, I won't talk. I'll ask questions about about ESG. You'll do the talking. Um, how easy is it to convince investors of your ESG credentials, um, given a number of stakeholders? Still, vehem uh, still vehemently anti-tobacco to the extent of questioning the industry's reasoning for promoting vaping and heating tobacco products. And the World Health Organization effectively did that prior to the recent uh, no smoking day. So how can you convince investors? How can you get better? What can you do better, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, I, I give you quite an emotional answer. I wouldn't be here having joined Imperial and the industry, if I really wouldn't, if I wouldn't believe there's a, a great opportunity for the industry to make a difference. Because the reality is about you have today, every day, a billion consumers out there smoking. And we have the opportunity, but also the responsibility as an industry to offer these consumers, these 1 billion humans out there, a better alternative. And I think that is a very significant contribution we can make. Yeah. At the same time, we'll also make the contributions as a responsible company that we as Imperial clearly are on all other fronts on ESG, whether that's the environmental impact, whether that's the social impact. So I, my answer here is quite simple. You have our full commitment as any responsible big consumer goods company, make our, our overall contribution to the ESG agenda that I think it's absolutely right for any major company to do. And on top, we as an industry will make our contribution to help our consumers on that transition to less harmful nicotine deliveries. Okay, I just want to flip slightly, um, but still in the context of, um, of ESG. Um, the majority of people on this call, not everybody, but the majority will be, will be guilty of looking at your business through the lens of the equity. Now, it's possible that at some point in the future, Imperial Brands raises equity for some reason we're not aware of at the moment, but we probably all agree outside of the business that the likelihood of that may be relatively low, like, may be wrong. Yeah. We we'll probably guess the, the view is the other way. You'll be buying yourselves back. We'll come on yeah. to that. My question is, given the focus on ESG, to what extent does the business think about its future ability to source funding and liquidity from the world's debt markets. Sure, I mean it's something I spend quite some time on. Yeah, and reality is why there might be some noise out there. I mean it's very clear. Imperial, like the rest of the industry, has no issue to source funding. Yeah, in the debt markets, and I think one of the things. Um, to keep in mind is about one thing the company has done very well over many years, use quite a diverse portfolio of funding options. Yeah, so it doesn't really rely on one area. It also has funding from a, from a uh, maturity perspective all over the range. So I think this is an area I wouldn't be concerned about. Yeah, our, our latest uh, when we went in the debt market has been largely oversubscribed. So we're not seeing any signals that that really will change. Yeah. So I think this is an opportunity. I think the ESG discussion, honestly, is much more on, on the equity side than it is on the debt side. 
Okay. Um, I'll, I'll go back to, to, to the, the training in the business. Now, we're, we're clearly still in a, an, un, an uncertain time, uh, given COVID, etc. Perhaps less uncertain than we were this time last year. Could you sort of give us a sense of your uh, confidence of the outlook for the second half of this year compared to the second half of last year, accepting you only walked into the business by memory in July of last year. So maybe Peter can jump in, but, but what's, the visit, what's the relative visibility you have today? I, I, I think, Jerry, you, you're absolutely right. I think that the visibility now is significantly better, but it's clearly not perfect. Yeah, I think when I came in the business, and logically I would have spent quite some time with the team even before, I mean, when, when we all in March looked at COVID, I think nobody would know what this would look like. Yeah, and I think, to be fair, the team uh, has done a great job of managing through that. Yeah, I mean, virtually we didn't lose sales in that period of time. In some markets, we actually gained market share because we were more agile than some of our competitors to respond back to consumer needs. Yeah, I think the challenge but when, it, when you ask me next half year, especially in our case, fiscal year ends at the end of September, I have a good level of visibility, I would say. If you ask me, and we now have a monthly performance process with all the top markets, which we didn't have before. So every month, actually last week, I see all the markets, what's the consumer offtake, what's the channel mix, I can see tra travel retail, I see border shops and so on. The sense I'm getting from looking at the business mm -hmm. is, see a certain level of 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 normality start and return slowly by slowly i think much slower than any of us thought when you specifically look at the recovery of the travel retail channel and we buy data from the big travel retail providers as an example of reviews that so my sense is it is improving but it's improving slower than many other people assumed yeah at the same time i think we as imperial one of the things it's a strength of our culture. We can deal with crisis. And I think it has shown up one of the key strengths of Imperial. We can deal with things. And I think we have done that well. But reality is a relatively good visibility. Uh, I think the direction of travel for the time being seems to be going one direction, but it's slower than I think any of us anticipated. This is going to sound like a slightly naive uh, question, um, but I think as we went into COVID, uh, the performance of the industry, and to be fair, a number of others, has probably been a lot better than people initially thought March, April of, of 2020. As we come out of COVID, yes, uh, travel retail uh, will come back, but, and that, that will have consequences from a negative margin perspective as well, because of you know, UK consumers, et cetera, et cetera, and other consumers for that matter. Um, but if you travel retail will come back, so duty free will come back. There's a discount on the travel retail because of the relative margin of Northern European consumers traveling elsewhere. But you've got a rise of illicit trade. Uh, you've maybe got governments looking at fiscal deficits and, you know, let's be clear, tobacco is, is up there in terms of, of where they go first. And then the removal of various government support schemes for people that are on furloughs, etc. So the question I'm asking is, which is the, perhaps the naivety or, or silly ele element of the question, but I think there's some logic to it. Is coming out of COVID perhaps going to be not as quite as positive as people perceive it to be for the tobacco industry? I, I, I think, Jerry, the, I think as we slowly cut, I mean, number one, I think when in comparison to many other industries, I think COVID had a lesser impact on our industry. I think that's a fair starting point. Yeah, I do believe um, when you look from a pure volume perspective, yeah, and perhaps a cross margin perspective that you rightly refer to about country mix, there's going to be some headwind as COVID starts to disappear. I think the unknown in this one is about will certain consumption pattern behaviors changes that we've seen in COVID, will they, will they go away again or not? Yeah. At the same time, we shouldn't forget, because we always talk about top line performance, but let's also not forget 
our industry, like many other industries, has taken on some extra costs as a result of COVID. I mean, most prominently in the factory, social distancing means you actually have to run longer shifts to produce the same kind of volume in some cases, which brings some extra costs in. Your stock levels are elevated because you want to protect the sense against travel disrupt, uh, the logistics disruption. Yeah. So there's some things. I think it's fair to say that when COVID completely unwinds, there will be a certain period of time where it will be a headwind for the industry. I, I think at the same time, as you mentioned, illicit and so on, we don't know whether illicit will completely reset to its original levels or whether there is going to be a beneficial overall reduction of that. The one thing I feel our assessment would be, um, yes, you're right, I think governments will look for tax revenue. At the same time, and that's probably not that well known, I mean, tobacco isn't such a big contributor any longer as it used to be in the past. Yeah. And I think governments in, are increasingly recognizing that the consumer profile of, of, of tobacco actually means excise increases hit the poorer parts of the population harder. So I think we see the first signs of recognition about being more careful, being more mindful about where it actually tax increases put pain on the population. Okay. Um, I want to come back to um, bigger picture, just strategic uh, parts uh, of, the, of the conversation. When you walked into Imperial, what did you think of the culture of the business? Did you need to change it? What were your observations? Yeah, I think the, I'll be very candid with you. Um, it was a business that in many parts of it, I mean, there was a great spirit historically about a challenger company and kind of a company that goes places that you will know well as you've covered the sector for a long period of time, Jerry. Yeah, but it's it's very clear as the, as the business started to lose share in its core portfolio, in its core tobacco business and its efforts on the NGP side were less successful than anticipated. You clearly, uh, the morale of the organization clearly suffered in that period of time. And what then happened as well, and it's it's kind of the data comes from the employee engagement survey, you saw a lot of silo behavior starting to appear as happens in organizations when they kind of are not successful in the marketplace, yeah? So the great news, honestly, I believe is about with a clearer strategy, that also re-recognizes the importance of our core business, which for a period of time was also neglected, not just in market share, but all the focus of the top management went towards NGP. And you had the majority of the employees working in the core tobacco business, and they felt to a certain extent ignored. Yeah. And I think therefore the new strategy is inherently a morale booster for the organization. And the what I talked before, being able to report half year results, top line up bottom line up, cash flow up, yeah, and market share erosion, yeah, is actually being stopped in our core markets. I think you can see how this will be morale boosters over time. It will take some time, but in reality also um, us going out and saying we will reinvest marketing dollars in our core business is a very important message to our organization. So it will take some time to repair some of the damage of the last couple of years, to be candid. But you know what? All the early signals, what I'm seeing, are quite positive. Yeah. Don't forget, there are more than 25,000 people who get out of bed every morning, one in peril to win. Yeah. And we have been a winning organization in the past. And there's nothing that I won't believe we can reachieve that again. Great. Thank you for that. So I've got two more questions uh, before we end. Time is beginning to get against us. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to uh, ask the, um, I, dare, I, dare, I, dare, I dare say boring, but maybe it is boring, share buyback question. And I'm sure. going to couch it this way. Can you help us understand what the rating agencies are saying to you about a share buyback? Forget the maths that me and everybody else does. What are the rating agencies telling you? Well, I think, number one, I've spoken with all of them as part of my job, so are you pro... Not every CEO spends some time with the rating agencies, but I felt this is important to really understand all the stakeholders in the company. Um, and I asked them the question. Yeah, reality is simple. I mean, the, the, the rating agencies in itself don't have a point of view on share buybacks. What they have a point of view is about how you're using your capital. Yeah, and, and your free cash flow, how to distribute it between different stakeholders. Yeah, and I think 
what was very positive for me, and it's a very open discussion with them. Um, they are excited about the new strategy for simple reason. With the new strategy, A, as you will know, before I joined, we, we reduced the dividend payout. So we now have the flexibility to reduce our debt levels to the levels that we have promised and committed to the rating agencies before. And to be honest, the rating agencies are just capturing the needs of, of, of our debt investors. Yeah. So a reality will put this stakeholder in a much more comfortable position overall. Yeah. And their point of view is that what, what is important in my discussion with the rating agents is saying, Stefan, you do need to do the right things to ensure this business is properly invested in for its future growth and success. Yeah, because we can all get excited about share buybacks. The reality is the biggest job I have to do with my team to ensure this business can consistently deliver net revenue and operating profit growth in the business. And we're making with the strategy these decisions. That's baked in our strategic plan. The great news is we operate in an industry that inherently is very cash generative. So inherently, this is a this is an industry and a company that can pay a very attractive dividend yield to its equity investors, pay down its debt to the right level, and once we are the right level, also return further cash to our shareholders. I'll ask one more. Can you before I go to my last one? Can you can you envisage a situation where Imperial makes an acquisition that's a sufficient size that would push out the current trajectory of the board thinking about share buybacks, push that out two or three years, or is that kind of transaction very unlikely? I, I just don't see it. Yeah, I mean, I think okay. the reality is, and I think you have it committed in our strategy. We, we clearly said we, we don't see M&A as a key driver. There's so much self-help opportunity inside the company. Why add something when I already have so much that I can do better inside the company? Yeah, I think that's that's yep. you will not see any push out of a share buyback just because we suddenly uh, come back and say we want to make a big acquisition. I think we have all the opportunities in house. We've now improved the skill set inside the company. We've laid out our store what level of incremental investments in marketing and sales we need to get our brands to the right place. And that's very visible to our shareholders. We won't surprise you with a big acquisition. Well, that was a pretty clear statement. So, so thank you for that. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll end with, um, uh, I'll end with the final question, obviously, but, it, but it's this. You're, you're in the business now for nearly 12 months, but not quite. Yeah. Could you talk about, um, uh, you know, what would be, what is your goal for Imperial over the next, let's say, five years from now? Where would you like to see the business be? What are your big picture objectives? Yeah. I, I really, I mean, I would love this business to be rejuvenated to its real full potential. That's, that's for me. I think this is, is something I really get excited. This is a great company. It should be a great company, yeah? And it has all the ingredients, yeah? And I think it should play an, a key role. I mean, our consumers out there, that we are the one that meets their needs, yeah? It's one that meets their needs in our core business. If that's what our consumers choosing, we want to have something that they really get excited about. But I also want them to have something from Imperial, to your point, whether it's in heated tobacco or on nicotine or vaping, that they can get excited about a, a meaningful number of the consumers can get excited about our offer out there. Yeah, that I think is the core essence, what I want to achieve with the team in the next five years. And the site's consequence, if we achieve that, I think we'll create some really good shareholder value in the process. Yeah, given the nature, if we get these things right, to Peter's point before, there's so much more value to be created from our core business. But there's also an exciting opportunity on the NGP side that in that time frame of five years that you mentioned, I really believe I have an opportunity to satisfy what consumers want and also create shareholder value. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're more or less bang on time. Um, Stefan, Peter, thank you for your time. The very insightful comments. Do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Really enjoyed the Thanks, conversation. Sir.